Hi everyone, in this lecture we are going to learn about system design th techniques. These are rules of thumb that it's good for uh, designers of a computer system to keep in mind uh, when they are making decisions or choices about various aspects of system design. So let's begin by first looking at what we mean by system design. Uh, it's the art and science of integrating various resources and components into a, a, a fully functioning harmonious whole that achieves certain performance targets or design targets or functional targets. So it is not a clear-cut science. Uh, sometimes there is a lot of good judgment involved and experience involved in making those good judgments. For example, there are things that you cannot quantify easily in numbers uh, such as simplicity of the system, scalability, modularity, uh, maintainability, uh, and so forth. Uh, but then often there are trade-offs required uh, in order to achieve these properties. So, so you may have to spend more money so that the system becomes more simple and modular and more maintainable. So uh, we can generally identify some of these principles of good system design uh, that we can apply repeatedly uh, over different systems from different domains. So whenever you are designing a system, you have to think about the design space. What we mean by that is uh, that we have to think about the goals, performance goals of the system and the resource constraints, uh, that is the resources with which we have to work. So, uh, so performance metrics and resource constraints uh, they, they form basically the, up, uh, the, the lower bound and the upper bound of the system being designed. So performance metric means the targets, the minimum performance target that a system being designed must meet. Uh, for example, you might have to meet a certain number of requests being processed per second by a web server. Or uh, if you are doing a stock transaction system, then it should each transaction should take no longer than 100 milliseconds. Uh, or your entire project should be completed within, uh, say, three months. Uh, that's another performance metric. Um, or your system should not fail uh, more than once every 10 years. Uh, so, and oftentimes, meeting one performance metric might affect uh, another performance metric. For example, if you try to lower the cost of a system, you might end up increasing the failure rate of the system. The other uh, aspect of design space is the resource constraint, which means the limits on the resources you have to work with. Uh, there are some resources that are more constrained than others. For example, uh, you might have limited I.O. bandwidth on a mobile device uh, for communicating over the network, but you may have a lot of computation power um, on the device. Um, or you might have very little battery power. So, so these, uh, so there are unconstrained resources and there are constrained resources. And oftentimes you may have to trade off the unconstrained resource for the uh, constrained resource. For example, you may want to use more computation power to do compression so that you have you use less network bandwidth in sending data. So, uh, also the what's a resource and what's a metric is really dependent on the situation. Uh, for example. Uh, say latency. Latency could be a metric in one situation and a resource constraint in another situation. Uh, say for example the stock trading example I mentioned earlier, there if every tra stock transaction should take no longer than 10 milliseconds, then that's a, a performance metric. Whereas if uh, you're designing a system that communicates over a satellite link, then there is uh, 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 it becomes a resource constraint, like the, maybe the packet latency uh, is at least 250 millisecond. So here are some common metrics and resources that we might consider in a system design. Uh, for example, time, uh, space, money, labor costs, bandwidth, social constraints, and scaling. Uh, so just to give some examples, for time, we talked about latency in the previous slide, uh, but it could be development time for a project or, or the failure rate, uh, 
um, or you know how many clock cycles does it take for a particular task to execute in terms of space you may talk about the amount of memory consumed or storage consumed the size of a packet the number of instructions in a particular piece of code or the lines of code if you are uh, measuring the, the like a developer's effort um, and then like money is obvious you know how much does a project cost uh, labor uh, how many person hours of work are required and bandwidth is generally uh, specified as uh, space divided by time space per unit time so you could uh, for example bits per second um, is uh, defines the throughput or the bandwidth of a network link or bytes per second might define the throughput of a storage system uh, instructions per second might define the speed of your CPU uh, or lines of code per hour might define the productivity of a programmer right or the hourly cost might define uh, the, the rate of burn uh, of budget for a project right and then there are standards uh, that industry standards for example IEEE standards or or, or uh, some other standards for the specific product that you must meet um, and there may be market requirements these again might be metrics or constraints depending on, um, on on the system being designed scaling refers to the ability of your system to handle uh, bigger input or bigger loads um, for example uh, you uh, how many machines uh, are there in the cluster there your uh, say high performance computing workload should run or the number of users your cloud workload should support or the amount of data that should be processed by a data processing uh, application. So when designing a system under resource constraints to meet a cert certain performance target, uh, it's a good idea to try to aim for a balanced system. What does that mean? So when we are trying to meet a certain performance target, let's say we are not able to meet that target, uh, then what that means is some resource in the system is bottlenecked uh, meaning that we are using some resource in the system and it's being utilized fully and it's preventing us from reaching our performance target so uh, so in order to improve the performance uh, we have to eliminate this bottleneck so there are two ways to eliminate a bottleneck one is to add more resources which may not always be possible for example your uh, cell phone has certain amount of battery power and you probably cannot easily increase the battery power. So um, uh, the other option is to balance the system. What that means is that there are some, maybe some unconstrained resources that are not bottlenecked, so you could use more of those to uh, use less of the bottlenecked resource. Um, so for example, uh, you, know, you might, uh, uh, for example, want to use compression to reduce the amount of data sent over a Wi-Fi link of a certain cap capacity, right, of a limited capacity. Um, or you might want to uh, slow down your application so it burns less power so that your battery lasts longer. Um, so, uh, so in a balanced system, you're basically doing this trade-off between unconstrained resource to save on the constrained resource uh, so that your final performance targets are met. So all, um, if, if, you, if you reach a system where all resources are equally constrained, then, uh, uh, then uh, uh, and at the same time you're still meeting the performance target, then that's the ideally balanced system. Uh, what that means is that you're using no more resources uh, than necessary and no less resources than needed. Um, so an example uh, is, you know, you could take say Henry Ford's Model T, one of the earliest mass market cheap cars. Uh, there the goal was to reduce the cost of the car, uh, not to like improve the quality or reliability of the car. Uh, although there were some minimum requirements, as long as those minimum requirements were met, you, the main metric was to reduce the cost of the car, make it more affordable. So Henry Ford would send his engineers out to junkyards where they would find Model T cars that had broken down and that were no longer usable for some reason. And they would find out which parts of the car were still working, uh, which still had more life in them. And the purpose was to go back to the factory floor 
and reduce the quality of those particular parts that were still working so that they could reduce the cost of the car. Uh, because if, say, your transmission failed and your car is not usable anymore, then it's no point having a fancy radio system or a fancy steering wheel or, or leather seats in the car, right? Uh, so, uh, so by reducing the quality of the parts that were still outliving the bottleneck resource, you are, you are able to reduce the cost of a system. So here are some common design techniques in no particular order uh, that you may encounter frequently as a computer system designer uh, where you might have to use these techniques to make certain design trade-offs uh, or, or meet certain performance targets. So I, I will go over some of these techniques in more detail uh, in the subsequent slides. So the first common design technique is multiplexing. What that means is that we are trading off time for space and money. Uh, now, we can get very specific examples. Uh, so for example, you have a, a fixed one resource that is limited in quantity. Uh, let's say you go to a bank and there, is, there are only, say, one or two or three tellers at the, at the counter. And there are a lot more customers, so we don't have one teller per customer uh, because it will be expensive uh, and it would take up more space for the bank to have so many tellers. So instead what they do is they make the customer stand in a line and the few tellers who are available, they would divide their time um, across many customers. One at a time, they would serve each customer. So here we are trading off time. We are using more time for the customer to save space and money for the bank. Right? Uh, similarly, long distance uh, trunks or long distance communication links, they usually provide a lot of bandwidth. For example, you can send a lot of uh, data per second, a lot of bits per second over these uh, long distance trunks. But the queuing delay tends to be terrible. Uh, like it will, if, you, if you put a uh, byte on, on a long distance trunk, it will take a few hundred milliseconds possibly to reach the other end across the Pacific Ocean. So uh, so that's another example of, of multiplexing. The, uh, the third example is, say, a common one in most computers. You have one CPU or two or three. Uh, you don't have indefinite amount of CPUs, but you may have a lot of processes running on this uh, on that CPU. So the time on a single CPU is being shared by many processes, and the trade-off is that the processes have to wait longer in order to get service from the CPU. So you you might have uh, understood this idea that you could do multiplexing around the, along the dimension of time or space, uh, and uh, temp so so this give, these are, these terms are temporal multiplexing and spatial multiplexing. Temporal multiplexing meaning means sharing time on a limited resource, and spatial multiplexing meaning means sharing space on a limited resource. So usually whenever a resource is limited, you need some system component that schedules access to the resource, that provides access to the resource among the multiple users. Uh, for instance, when you're boarding a plane, there is uh, usually um, uh, an air hostess who, who checks your boarding pass and makes people stand in line uh, to let them in. You don't have one air hostess for each passenger, right? Uh, similarly, uh, when, on, a, on a CPU, as we discussed, uh, there, there is usually a CPU scheduler which decides which process gets to run on the CPU uh, at a certain time. Uh, similarly, for network links, there is some network link scheduler which decides which packet gets to be transmitted on the network link among the many packets waiting. Memory manager decides who get to use limited memory resources uh, in the DRAM and whose memory pages would be kicked out to the swap device, right? Or for a professor, if you have, we have office hours where uh, we, we meet students, right? Um, and, and we divide time among multiple students. If there are more students uh, waiting, then, then, you know, only one student can get attention at a time. So, so these are all examples of multiplexing along either temporal or spatial dimension. Uh, so sometimes multiplexing might be hidden 
from the end user. Uh, so which what me that means is that the resource might appear to be virtualized for the end user, but uh, underneath you're sharing a resource. For example, each process thinks it has its own dedicated CPU, uh, but then underneath it is sharing the operating system is multiplexing a single physical CPU among many, many processes. Um, or the same thing for virtual memory, where every process thinks it has dedicated virtual address space, but a single physical memory is being shared among many uh, virtual memory address spaces. So, and a related idea is that of statistical multiplexing. What that means is that we sometimes we overbook or overcommit a resource uh, in order to, uh, uh, so, uh, in, with the expectation that not all the users might end up using the resource. Uh, uh, common examples are like you know, doctor's appointments or, or airplane uh, booking, where you know, usually they you would uh, doctors would book more patients than the time available uh, for all the patients because some patients usually cancel certain fraction of patients you may, might cancel so uh, so so that way uh, if they buy overbooking they will uh, keep their entire time productive right. And similarly, airplanes uh, book more seats than the number of seats on the plane because many passengers usually cancel. Uh, so as a result, you know, it reduces the cost for the end user, but it also maximizes revenue uh, or resource utilization for the provider. Uh, and, and the same thing with virtual memory. Operating system promises a lot more memory to each process than the actual memory available, but um, with the assumption that not all processors will use their entire uh, four gigabytes of virtual address space. Another common example is uh, uh, pipelining versus parallelism, which is trading computation for time. Parallelism means that let's say you have n instance of a resource like n CPUs and then there are uh, n independent subtasks, then each of those independent subtasks could run on each of those n processors uh, side by side simultaneously. Pipelining refers to increasing the throughput of a system of a system by dividing a task into many stages. Uh, for example, you might have n stages of um, a serially dependent task and each task must be done one after another, uh, but each stage could be working on uh, on a different task at a different time and then they keep moving along the pipeline just very much like a factory uh, factory automation line so uh, so this this per principle parallelism and pipelining uh, can be used together they are not exclusive of each other uh, and and these are very often used both in in a CPU microarchitecture as well as uh, say for data forwarding uh, path of routers, internet routers. Um, so linear speed up means that if the throughput increases by a factor of n for n compute units, then you're getting a linear speed up. Uh, oftentimes that's not possible because there may be certain coordination uh, requirements or inefficiencies um, that might uh, prevent you from achieving a linear speed up. Um, so, uh, it's in any case, we talked about you know the bottleneck resource earlier, and one of the um, uh, 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 applications of that principle here is that this, uh, like, let's say you're doing pipelining, then the slowest processor along the pipeline would limit the throughput of the entire system. Um, or, or similarly, if there are n parallel processors and they need to synchronize at some point, the slowest processor would again limit the parallelism that you can get. So another design principle is called batching. What this means is that we want to trade response time to improve throughput. Uh, so batching means that we collect a number of tasks and then we execute them together. Uh, so by doing so, we hope to reduce the overhead of switching back and forth between different tasks. Uh, so what this uh, means is that you know, by, by collecting several tasks together, by waiting for several tasks to be collected together, uh, we, are, uh, we are affecting the response time. So if a user, say, expects response within a certain amount of time, uh, 
they may not get it because the amount of batching involved is preventing adding extra delay to the process. Uh, but then uh, there are benefits of batching is that you might reduce certain initialization or startup costs associated with individual tasks by batching them together. Um, so an example of this is interrupt coalescing. So normally network interface cards would send a one interrupt for every packet that is received. Uh, but then if the packets are arriving very rapidly, then there will be too many interrupts to the CPU uh, at a very high frequency, which might negatively affect the responsiveness and, and, and the behavior of the system. So another approach to prevent normal user process from being affected is to do interrupt coalescing, which means that you collect a bunch of packets in the network card and then you send one interrupt for uh, a, a multiple packets. So, so this is called uh, combining together multiple interrupts from packets, multiple packets into one packet. So one interrupt would then trigger the OS to handle multiple packets. Um, uh, similarly, if you, you, know, you have remote login sessions, instead of sending one byte, one packet for each byte that is typed on the uh, keyboard, you might uh, combine a bunch of character uh, inputs and then send them together to avoid the number of uh, uh, network uh, network packets that are sent to the destination. So. Uh, similarly, uh, old mainframe systems used to have a batching system where you submit a job, the, the job would be processed first in, first out, and, and there was no interactiveness with the end user. Of course, modern operating systems were redesigned to uh, incorporate interactiveness uh, and, and focus less on batching. So now, most modern operating systems prioritize response time over uh, background tasks which are batched. So another system design technique is to exploit locality. Uh, this is also known as caching. Uh, so usually we are trading space for time. What that means is that you know in a, any typical cache you might have a small amount of expensive memory closer to the source of computation, the location of computation, so that the access time to frequently access data is lower. Uh, so, uh, so you could do caching along spatial or temporal dimensions. So, for example, uh, spatial dimension is if you are, uh, say, using a particular piece of data, and then you can expect that the nearby pieces of data may be uh, needed very soon. So, so you might prefetch the nearby pieces of data and keep them in the cache, uh, so that they are accessed. They will be ready when when they need to be accessed. Uh, temporal locality means the same piece of data may be reused multiple times, so you would keep that around with the expectation that it would be used very soon. So there are caches at all different uh, levels of computer system. From hardware, you have instruction, data caches, TLBs, um, you know, on web servers, maintain web caches where they keep frequently accessed web pages in the memory, uh, so you don't, they don't have to look up the disk. Route lookup caches remember uh, uh, routes for packets that are coming frequently to a particular destination. Uh, similarly, file system buffering is a page cache that keeps frequently accessed storage data in the main memory. Uh, then, you know, a related idea is virtual memory paging, where you uh, uh, swap out pages that are not needed in the near future. So a related system design technique to caching is the idea of making the common case fast. So caching is an example of making the common case fast, uh, where you know, the common case is to identify the piece of data that are needed in the near future or needed frequently and keep them around near the source of computation. So, so there's a very you know, loosely defined rule called the 80-20 rule or 90-10 rule or whatever you might want to call it, which says that, you know, 80% of the time is spent in 20% of the code. Uh, or in other words, you know, most of the time is spent in very small part of the code. So the question is, how do you identify that small part of the code where most of the time is spent uh, by an application? Because if you can identify that piece of code, then you can, um, you can optimize only that part of the code to improve the general performance of your application. You don't have to spend time optimizing the other part the other 
because as long as it works reasonably well, nobody's going to complain because that 80% of the code is used or 80% or of the features are used so infrequently. So, uh, so there are again, you know, many examples, but some examples are the risk machines, which identify some basic instructions that must be supported by the CPU and spend all the real estate on the CPU just optimizing those instructions. And then they worry, don't worry about more complex instructions that can be constructed um, uh, by, by putting together these simpler instructions, right? Or similarly, uh, uh, router data path, we discussed, you know, how they optimize the common case uh, of in, in the data forwarding path for route lookup and so forth. Another interesting system design concept is the use of hierarchy, binding, and indirection. So hierarchy is typically used for scaling and delegation of authority. Uh, for example, uh, most of the networks here, you have a, managing a large network, you might break it up into subnets, uh, subnetworks where each of which is a self-contained domain under the authority of the larger domain, but then there is some degree of autonomy within the domain to manage itself and, and route traffic and so forth. Um, um, or in say a process hierarchy where a parent process may fork child processes which may fork other child processes and with some amount of loose control between parent and uh, for parent process or the child processes. And this allows you to use more resources like child process can run on other CPUs uh, and, and use more computation power or they could run on other machines you know, to run to use more uh, computation power on other machines. So uh, binding refers to the idea that if you have a resource, you have to give it a name in order to access it. So there's a binding from the name to the resource. Like every person has a name. Uh, you're a person, there, you have a name. So if I want to, uh, if you are in front of me, I can ask you, what's your name? And you will tell me your name. So I know the binding between the name and the person. So when I want to refer to you, I will call your name and I know I'm talking to you. Uh, so indirection refers to um, figuring out this mapping from the name to the resource being addressed. So again, using the you as an example, like if you're not in front of me, but I want to know who is this person with this name, I might go up on the student enrollment system and look up your information, it might show your photograph, and now I know that this name maps to this person with this information. Or someone might you know, Google search your name and then get a whole lot of information about, uh, uh, about you as a person, right? So that's again binding. Uh, so the same thing can be applied to computer systems. So for example, computers have names, they're human readable names like remote.cs.binghamton.edu, uh, and then there is an IP address that identifies a specific machine. If you want to connect to a particular machine, you specify the human readable name, and then there's a domain name service that is queried by a computer to figure out the IP address of remote.cs.binghamton.edu so that you can establish a TCP connection with this machine. Uh, similarly, if you're sending an email to somebody, you may not remember their email address, but there may be a directory server that where if you can provide the name, it will give you the email address that you can uh, use for your email. Um, or in virtual memory system, a process accesses virtual addresses, uh, which refer to virtual page numbers, and there's a mapping from virtual page number to a physical page number. This information is contained in the page table, so the memory management unit will look up the page table to figure out the binding from virtual page number to physical page number. Or in mobile communication, like everyone has a cell phone and cell phones have phone numbers, right? Uh, uh, but then the, the binding from phone number to, to the device is not fixed, it can change. So if you were calling somebody uh, and, and you have their phone number, then in order to find out where is this device, there is some server somewhere in, the, in your phone company's infrastructure that will perform this mapping from phone number to device uh, and then it would connect you to the correct device being accessed by the user. So another system design technique is um, virtualization where you want to do multiplexing uh, but you also want to make the resource appear 
as if it is a dedicated resource so that um, dedicated virtual resource right uh, so so it's a combination of multiplexing and indirection uh, for example you know we talked about virtual machines we have talked about how process the virtual CPUs or virtual memory um, and you can apply this concept to networks like virtual private networks virtual overlay networks uh, virtual web servers and so forth uh, where you get the illusion of having a dedicated resource and in real world for example you you make a customer service call and and that person gives a specific name uh, say and it says I hey hi I am John uh, but then John may not be the real name of that representative because if that representative leaves the next time you call their same service center and say I want to talk to John then it may be a different person who has taken on the alias of John right um, so re so this is essentially virtualization you, you get the illusion of a dedicated resource whereas behind the scenes there's multiplexing going on and randomization uh, is another technique where it's, it's more like more of a trick that you can use when you have to break a tie between uh, when there's a contention for a resource uh, and, and there is no clear rule on who should get the resource. For example, you know, several people in a room start to speak at the same time and nobody can understand each other. So they all become quiet. They wait for random amounts of time and they try to speak again. So the first person who uh, picks the smallest wait time then wins. And, and gets to speak and others uh, listen. <clears throat> so that's an example. It's, it's also this technique is used in wireless networking where the wireless media is common and shared. So if multiple computers talk at the same time, their signals will collide and get corrupted. So again, the CSMA CD allows computers to back off and then pick a wait time, randomly pick a wait time so that uh, the, the, the computer with the smallest wait time would then win and get to talk. And, and there are many examples used throughout uh, uh, you know, networking where randomization is used to break a tie. When we are designing systems that uh, require reliability of some sort, we have to consider whether the system is going to be a hard state or a soft state system. So what that means is um, soft hard state systems, they would remember certain information about the uh, other parties they are interacting with, whereas soft state systems are uh, purely transactional in that one transaction at a time. They only uh, process one transaction at a time. They don't remember any information beyond the period of the transaction. So a hard state system might be that you like register for a class and then you and then the you know system or university system remembers that you are part of the class. Uh, Whereas a soft state system might be that you don't register for the class, but then you just show up uh, at each class and you pay for each class, right? So, so this university doesn't need to remember who you are because you pay every time you come for a class. So that's a soft state. So similarly, computer systems can be hard state or soft state. Uh, for example, TCP connections in networks, they are uh, hard state because after establishing a connection, each side remembers who the other party is and it would uh, remember the state of the connection, how many bytes have been transferred, how many bytes have been acknowledged, what's the congestion window, and so on. Uh, so if a connection breaks, then reestablishing a connection takes time. Uh, whereas UDP traffic, for example, is a soft state. You, whenever you want to send some packet to someone, you just put the address and the port number uh, it, of that uh, other endpoint in the in the packet and send it and when the packet is received by the other side is delivered so there's no reliability no acknowledgement but also there's no state maintenance so if there's a network failure you know these si two sides can just uh, when they start off you know they, they don't remember anything about the past it's a new conversation so both have their advantages soft state systems are more robust and and they're simpler to design uh, but they also take up more information and uh, uh, for every message or every transaction. Whereas hard state systems, uh, there's more overhead in establishing the connection and they are less failure resistant. But then uh, once a state is established, when the hard state is established, then you don't have to uh, 
uh, repeat that hard state so it adds to efficiency of the system. So hysteresis applies to systems that uh, have certain threshold values around which the state of the system changes. So you take an example of a thermostat at home. So if this was designed around a single threshold, we set the temperature to 72 degrees, as soon as the temperature reaches slight and infinitesimally small delta above 72, this, the, uh, the heating turns off. And when it reaches small delta below 72, the heating turns on. If that delta is so small uh, it, it, it as to be negligible, then your heating system will be constantly turning on and off and soon you, you it will break, right? Um, to prevent the oscillation, you can increase the delta to say, say one degree centigrade. So, so if it, the temperature falls below 71 degrees, the heating turns on and if the temperature fall, goes above 73, then the heating turns off, right? So, um, so this makes the system more stable and your heating system doesn't turn on and off as often. The same principle can be applied to other uh, systems as well. Uh, for example, in main memory, uh, let's say your memory usage is about 90%, then the OS might recognize it has to free memory. So it can keep freeing memory till the free memory reaches like 20%. Uh, so your memory usage falls below 80%. And, um, and then it would stop swapping. And then when the memory usage again increases about 90%, then it starts swapping again. So, the, um, so having this hysteresis uh, provides some buffer and provides more system stability. Uh, so essentially, we are uh, uh, having multiple thresholds allows uh, you to define events so that the state transitions are th are th uh, are dependent upon the, uh, different state transitions depend on different thresholds. Uh, so, or rather, the threshold for state transitions is state dependent. Um, so, uh, so this is a useful thing to keep in mind. Whenever you find yourself putting a threshold into a system, a single threshold, step back and think, you know, should I make it two or even more thresholds so there's greater stability in the system? Another common system design technique is separating policy and implementation. What this means is that uh, certain policy decisions that guide the behavior of the system uh, would be different from how those mechanisms are implemented within the system. Uh, for example, uh, you might have a page replacement policy that sets certain thresholds on when to start swapping out pages and when to stop swapping out pages, like the thresholds we discussed earlier. Or it might specify an algorithm to use, such as least recently used or first and first out or most frequently used or whatever the algorithm may be, right? Uh, so that's a configuration parameter, whereas the actual implementation of page replacement policy within the operating system might take whatever these configuration parameters are and faithfully execute them. So it makes the implementation simpler, possibly faster, and it, it also makes it simpler to change the policy or the configuration aspect of the system without having to change the implementation. Uh, <clears throat> this also is found commonly in computer networks where there's a separation between data plane and control plane. Data plane refers to packet forwarding path. As packets come in, you have to decide which output port the packet should go to. And these decisions have to be fast and very quick. And the implementation has to be simple. Uh, whereas control plane defines the configuration aspects uh, of the system. For example, what is the routing table? Uh, how, which subnet traffic should be tra uh, forwarded to which other subnet? Uh, what are some, you know, uh, quality of service requirements, um, and and so forth. So, uh, so the configuration can change over time, uh, but the data forwarding uh, policy uh, plane, data plane, should be such that it just faithfully implements that uh, whatever policy. Uh, similarly, you know, there's this separation between. In, in connection-oriented networks, uh, you, you might establish a connection ahead of time. Once the connection is established, the, the simple data forwarding path just looks at the connection identifier in each packet and forwards the packet without worrying about where the packet is specifically going. So, uh, so connection establishment is the control plane, which happens infrequently, and then 
Data forwarding is the data plane which happens very frequently. Another um, design uh, consideration is to allow for extensibility. Every system evolves over time and when a system evolves then it has to still be compatible with its prior legacy versions. So uh, at the same time it has to support new features. So when designing a system we have to leave space for these new extensions. Um, for example every network protocol is within messages there are certain fields of the message that are reserved for future extensions or future use. Uh, for example, in IP headers, there is an IP version field. So since IP has evolved from IPv4 to IPv6, uh, the reserved field in IPv4 header allowed for that extension to happen in the future without knowing in the future what that extension would be. Similarly, the HTTP protocol has a version field that allows you to uh, figure out which version of HTTP protocol to use when uh, interpreting a web page. Uh, similarly, if there are modems whose speed uh, evolves and gets better over time, so uh, so there is a data exchange protocol which exchanges the data rate before modems agree to send data to each other. Right, so it allows for extension. Operating systems have kernel modules, so we don't, operating systems don't know what kind of functionalities these kernel modules may have, but by providing this extension capability, the operating systems allow for future growth, where you might even replace or upgrade an entire kernel by, by means of having a kernel module. So in summary, these are just a repertory of techniques, a toolbox of techniques that's nice to keep in mind when you're designing a system um, if you are familiar that these trade-offs exist and you are explicit about making those trade-offs in your design of the system, uh, then, uh, then you will end up with a much better uh, and cohesive system design uh, that meets your performance targets within the resource constraints. Now, um, so both good judgment and experience is important. There is no single formula for when to use which uh, of these techniques, just that, you know, some may be more appropriate than others in certain technique, uh, certain situations. Just like, you know, you don't want to use a screwdriver as a hammer, but although both are tools. So you, you need to know when to use which one. Uh, same thing applies for any computer system design techniques. So that's all we have.